So Jamla is asking if I'm going to teach them Christianity because we only got to Judaism. If you listened to the last episode of Jazzy World History, you heard that next Friday night the episode will be the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Yeah, Christianity. So here we go. How do you make your voice like that? <laughs> Skill. You used to be a broadcaster I know. So where we left off last time, okay? We're getting started now. Again, the Jews resisted the Roman Empire. This is just a recap where we left off last time. And the Roman Empire saw them as terrorists because they were killing Roman bureaucrats. They were killing Roman officials in Judea, the Jews, because they, you know, they, they were waiting for the Messiah. They wanted to drive these Romans out, so they were terrorists. Um, and the Roman government was harsh to them. The Jews are prophesying this Messiah, this king. According to the Jews, there it is, and I'll just put this whole thing up. Uh, a descendant of the king, and he has to have David's blood in him, who will drive out the pagan occupiers. You know what pagan is? Uh, satanic, according to the Christians. Pagans were normal. Pagans were your polytheists. Stop. Pagans were your polytheists back then. They're, they believe in nature gods. Jisu, pagan. Vocab word. They believe in nature gods. Not gods who created nature, but gods who are part of nature. So pagan. So they were waiting for a King David a descendant who would drive out pagan occupiers and, as we just said, free them and return them to the theocracy. Theocracy, to repeat, we talked about this in week one or two. Theo is God. Crassy is power or rule. And so it's a state run by God's law, not man's law, God's law. So that's the law of Moses, right? That was that God gave to Moses. So that's what the Jewish people are waiting for under the Romans, just a political Messiah, who's a political savior. Now, nope. So during this time, Jesus was born. He was born in 4 BCE. At the same time that Octavian, or Caesar Augustus, was the emperor of Rome. Remember, he was Julius Caesar's nephew, and he started the, the Principate? Principate? How do you say it? Yep. 4 BCE, we think. Uh. No, there is, uh, speaking strictly historically, there are historians who say we have no evidence that Jesus ever existed. And in fact, a lot of the things that are said about Jesus you can see in a lot of the pagan religions. You can see it in Egyptian religion, the, the, the God who died and came back to life. You can see all sorts of stories that, about Jesus in Greek religion, Egyptian religion, um, Babylonian religion, just all over the place, Roman religion, different cults. Um, but in any case, that's a minority view. Most people think that Jesus did indeed live. Why do we not know? Because he didn't, he didn't write anything. <coughs> he didn't write anything. He's like Confucius. He didn't write anything. His disciples wrote about him. We'll get there. So, so what did this guy Jesus do? He walked around Judea, the Roman Empire, preaching a gospel, good news. What was his gospel? Good news. And his preaching, very unlike the God of, uh, of the Jews, instead of being an angry, jealous God, because in the Old Testament, hear this, in the Old Testament, what does God's law say you do to a boy who disobeys and is disrespectful to his father? You stone him to death. A woman is raped, and I am paraphrasing straight from the book of Leviticus and Deuteronomy. Moses' law, there's five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. God says if a woman is raped, close enough to the city to be heard, and she does not cry out loud enough for the people in the city to come and rescue her, that woman shall be given to the man who raped her as his wife. Homosexuals should be stoned. There's debate now that the Bible really doesn't say it's the homosexual part that's bad, it's the um, sort of lustful sex. But that's a sort of 
homosexual argument. Um, so the point there, a very angry and a very violent God, it's hard to say that this Jewish God was all love when you think about the fact that he drowned the entire world except for one man who worshipped him, Noah. He drowned every single other person on the planet rather than finding another way to correct his creation besides instead just wiping every single person out. Because some of those people, it's hard to picture them being evil, isn't it? You think about the whole world, can you name a couple of people that maybe aren't evil enough to deserve to be drowned? Can you name an example? Huh? The poor people? How about the, how about the three-day-old baby? Right? There's a lot of people in the world. So, um, so along comes Jesus, an interesting, interesting evolution in Judaism. Jesus is a Jew, and he is preaching love and compassion and poverty and simplicity. One of his most interesting ones for me today is this. Fill in the blanks. It is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle. How easy is it for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle that a thread goes through? Is that? Yeah. Anybody know how that, that verse ends? Than it is for a rich man to pass through the gates of heaven. Rich people have a, have a smaller chance of going to heaven than a, than a camel does of going through the eye of a needle. When I see people in Lexuses going up, you know, driving into their church parking lot, it cracks me up. <laughs> right? And I doubt the preacher is like really emphasizing that verse very much because he would lose a lot of customers. Right? Um, so Jesus is preaching a very radical thing. He's very, and why? Because the rich were oppressing the poor back in ancient Rome. Um, the scriptures say perform miracles. I just don't like, I don't like talking a PowerPoint. I just hate it. That's why I don't do it. But he did, according to the scriptures, walk on water. You know this. You've seen the Disney movies or something. A man was dead. He came and said, rise, Lazarus, rise. And this man who had been dead in a tomb for days, wrapped in, in uh, funeral wrappings, you know, came back to life. And everybody was amazed. What is the view of sickness and medicine that we see in early Christian thought in this detail? Uh, it's not clear enough. A man was crazy. He was, he was the kind of person we see on the street today talking and just talking to himself and he seems to be like hallucinating and just like crazy and he's like, you know, just, you know, you've seen crazy people on the street before, haven't you? People with mental problems. Well, Jesus came and, and came up to one and he said, demons, leave this man. He was a madman. Demons, leave this man. And the demons left him. Anybody know where they went? They went into pigs. The demons left the madman and the pigs that were nearby. Again, remember, this is a herding society. This is not like, this is ancient civilization. These are mostly herders because there wasn't much farming going on in this land. It was kind of dry. Um, and so there's just a herd of pigs over there and the pigs all like, get demon-possessed, and they become crazy and mad, and what do they do, Jesus? They run into the lake and drown. Yeah. That's the miracle. What do we see about the, uh, the, the understanding of sickness and, and madness? Yeah, so, so lepers, people who had the, the disease where your, your skin falls off and such, leprosy, right? Jesus would touch them and heal them. Again, a, a sort of a demonic thing. He turned water into wine, etc. All sorts of miracles. I just told you this. And, and uh, hear me, I am not anti- I don't mean to, no, I'll, I'll say I don't mean to be offensive or anything. I'm talking as a historian and as an analyst. So analyzing this stuff um, as just like what it shows us about beliefs and life. So he was a Jew, but he was a radical. Does anybody know this is a really important detail? 
Why was Jesus killed? Why was Jesus killed? What put him on the cross? No. Betrayed him and turned him into the cops. So we know that the cops came and arrested him, and then he was put on trial, and he was charged to die in the, on the cross. We know all that. But what crime did they want him for? Yeah, that's what they were worried about, but they still needed a, a, he had to, can we arrest him for anything, for breaking any sort of law? And, and this, is, this is it, it's a very famous scene. He angered the rabbis by going to the temple. Remember, how many temples have we seen by now? This is really important, the number of temples, right? There have been two temples so far. The Babylonians destroyed the first one, the Persians came in, let them build the second one. The second one's still going through the Persians, the Greeks, and now the Romans, that second temple was still there. Hundreds of years, that second temple was still there. So God, the one God, has his one temple. And Jesus goes into that temple because he was born in, in Judea. And he sees there a bunch of currency exchangers. You go to the airport, you see people changing money from one currency to another. And Jesus was furious because we've already said he, pre he preached the virtues of poverty, of caring not about things but about people compassion. And he sees money changers all over the place in the temple, the house of his father, God. And so he says, this, is, this, this, this money does not belong in the house of my father. And he creates a riot in the temple. Picture yourself, any of you who go to church, mosque, or anything else, walking into your church and turning over tables and throwing things off. Picture yourself trashing this classroom, because that's what Jesus did. He trashed the money changers, tables, and just created a big riot, a big commotion. Now again, critically, some people have said, and the Jews are one, Jewish thinkers think about what Jesus did with this, this extreme anti-materialistic, anti-money thing. Jews criticize this as, well, hello, the temple does need people to bring money and give it. Why? Why does the temple need people's money? To keep the preacher alive, and also, why do I need you to give me money in this classroom? To pay, to, to pay for the tea, right? So we've got sacrifices, we've got all sorts of things, and so, you know, it costs money, so we need money. And then people come, Salar, from different, from different parts of the empire, with different types of cash. And so we need to exchange the cash, right? Currency exchange. And so some people are like, you know, Jesus is kind of extreme. It's, it's not like there wasn't a reason to have it, but that's all interpretation stuff. Jesus claimed he was a spiritual Messiah. And this is what he was preaching. The kingdom of heaven is within you. A spiritual Messiah. And this is where Jesus is interesting. And this is what the Jews disagree with. The Jews are saying a Messiah is going to bring us independence. Instead, Jesus is saying, forget independence. Happiness and success is not having an independent country and, you know, all, of the, all that covenant stuff. Happiness and success is discovering the God inside yourself. the kingdom of heaven within you. After that riot, that's when basically the police put out warrants for Jesus' arrest, the guy who just started a riot in the temple. And yes, there's a lot of stories about Judas betraying him to the Roman police by kissing him on the cheek for 30 pieces of silver and all that sort of stuff. But the main point here is Jesus was arrested and he was crucified put on a cross, nailed, died, as a criminal. Why do Christians, some of them, hate Jews? Because it was the Jewish religious authorities who supported Jesus' crucifixion. The, the governor of Rome, Jamila, the governor of Rome, saw these Jews who he's governing and he wasn't a Jew, he was from the, you know, Rome, he was Italian. And he didn't share this religion, he was just controlling it for the empire. And he was like, really? You want to you wanna crucify this Jesus guy? I mean, it doesn't seem like 
okay, he started a riot in church, but really you want to nail him to a cross and crucify? That's a horrible way to die. And the, the Bible says, and I can let anybody go. Well, you know, it seems to me we should kind of like have mercy on this guy. And they're like, no, we want you to kill him. That's what the Bible says. And so the Jews are the bad guys in the Christian New Testament for supporting the crucifixion of the Son of God. This is, this is, this is all really, really, really wild stuff. The Bible claims that Jesus rose from the dead three days after his crucifixion. If you don't know, that's what Easter is all about. Easter holiday is Jesus being crucified on Friday and rising from the dead on Sunday. What does that have to do with Easter eggs? I have no earthly idea, <laughs> except I think it's a pagan thing, because it is springtime, and life is coming back, and bunnies are famous <laughs> for reproducing like bunnies, right? <laughs> you get a boy, a boy and a girl bunny, give it a week, you've got 500 bunnies. They just, they just reproduce like rabbits. We have an F word version of that sentence. They, they fornicate like rabbits, to make it Latin. Um, so, so there's a, there's a pagan thing in there. The Christian Bible later claims, and notice I said later, that Jesus is God. Born of a virgin, his mother Mary. God impregnated Mary without taking her virginity. The virgin birth. And his mother's name is Mary, you know that, right? Remember, God, Mary got pregnant from God, the Father, but Mary was a virgin. And Mary, of course, God doesn't have human form, so he got Mary pregnant miraculously. It's another miracle. And if that sounds weird to you, it's not so weird because we see the same thing. Zeus is getting mortal women pregnant left and right. He was a womanizer. Um, it, was, it, it was a common thing back then to think that God's got women pregnant. Right, so, um, but anyway, but then the real, the real, like shocking part is that God had His Son killed on purpose. God wanted His Son to die on a cross, the most horrible death. Although it was also like the common death, it was the electric chair of the Roman Empire. Right, crucifixion was common. That's just how we. That's a death penalty. We crucified. Hundreds of thousands of people were crucified. But do you remember Abraham and Isaac? God saying, Abraham, take your son Isaac and, and kill him. You remember that? Yeah. So do you see that Christianity, which is not Judaism, they took that story from Judaism of Abraham and Isaac, and they said, see, God is showing now that he loves us so much. Back then it was, Abraham, prove that you will obey me. Kill your son. And now the Christians have turned this message into it's not obedience, it's love. It's both. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son, and this is John 3, 16, that whoever believes in him, Jesus, won't perish, won't die, but will live forever, which later became go to heaven. So, yeah, and so Jesus, according to this Christian thing, was God performing a human sacrifice whose blood will wash away the sins of humankind. So, okay, so Jesus has died. That's the life of Jesus. Make a new subtopic. That was the life of Jesus. Make a new subtopic. Whoa. Yeah. Huh? Oh. Is this the destruction of second Yeah, and it's kind of a yeah, so real quick. 
after the Jews, after Jesus died, about 30 years later, something radical happened. The Romans destroyed the second temple. They were so tired of those Jewish terrorists that they just had enough. There was a Jewish uh, revolt, uprising, against the Roman Empire, and the Roman Empire just had enough of it. So in 60, I think 67 CE, 67 CE, Rome destroyed that temple. Now who cares? Does anybody know why we care? Good. And that kicking out is the diaspora. You should know this term. Dia, like, like diagram, dia, D-I-A. D -I -A. Write it down, D-I-A. Don't write, write down diaspora right now. We destroyed the temple, and then we, we just banished the Jews. D-I-A-S-P-O-R-A. Diaspora. To disperse. If I have a, if I, you know, if I pour some, some baby powder in my hand, Jamila, and blow it, it disperses. Yeah. The Jews did, the, the Romans did that to the Jews. They scattered them. And the Jews went in all directions because the Romans kicked them out. This was in the first century, like 70 CE. Now, what are the Jews saying to themselves? Look what just happened to us. We, we've lost our second temple, and we have been exiled again. I told you the pattern, exile, return. I'm reminding you of it. How many times have we seen the Jews exiled now and returned? The first exile was? Moses, the Egyptians. And then the next one? The next time they were exiled? The Babylonians. And then the Persians returned them. And now here we are, the third time the Romans exile them. And they never came back until 50 years ago. It's, that exile started in the Roman Empire, and it only ended 50 years ago. They came back. They've got Israel now. Dome of the rock. I've told you one story about one rock so far. Anybody remember it? Abraham, what did he, what's, what's the rock have to do with it? He had to kill a son on a rock. This dome is over the rock that Abraham, 2,000 years before Christ, is believed to have put little Isaac on and was preparing to sacrifice him for God. This dome is built over that. Now, who built this dome? Muslims. Not Jews, Muslims. Where is this dome? Here's where, it gets, here's where it just gets like, you will win the Nobel Prize, the Nobel Peace Prize, if you can solve this problem. It was built in Jerusalem, and not just in the old place. So, who, where the temple used to be. The Romans tore that temple down. The Jews were kicked out. They never came back until 50 years ago. And who moved in 600 years later? The Muslims, when Muhammad had his vision from Allah, who's God's Abraham, Abraham's God. And so Islam spreads into Palestine, and Muslims live there now. And they're like, oh, wow, there's the, there's the rock where God almost sacrificed. And I think in Islam, it's not Isaac, it's Ishmael. But I could be wrong on that. Uh, good, that's good. That's one we want right there. Can I, get a, can I get a larger size? How do I do that? No, it's the same size. Oh, well. So, well. Oh. Well, it's the same image. This is good enough. Boy, what did Jamila like fall in? Let me make sure I got that on the recording. Yeah, good. Okay. <laughs> There's the Dome of the Rock. Look what it's on top of. These are the walls of the second temple. The second temple was destroyed. This is the foundation. What do the Jews want to do with this temple? They want to rebuild it. Why is any attempt to rebuild the temple by removing this going to cause World War III? 
because the entire Muslim world around them, and you've drawn the map, you know that Israel is surrounded by Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Iraq, Iran, Saudi Arabia, all, on and up, Egypt, on and up, Turkey, all Muslim, encircled by Muslims. Third holiest building in Islam on top of the destroyed second temple. And the Jews, the, the Orthodox Jews, want to rebuild this temple because God is one God and he gets one temple. And so, but the Muslims put their third holiest building on top of it. Yes? Ishmael again is the father, of, is his half-brother, right. I know. Are you... No, no, no. The question is, did, did in the Quran, I'm saying, I think the Quran may have said that this rock under the dome, they, their, their version of the story is that Isaac did not, I'm sorry, Abraham did not sacrifice Isaac, who the Jews say, but Ishmael, his Arab son, right? The father of Islam. And I don't, I, again, I, I told you, I know what I don't know. I'm not sure about that. So, Jamila, you just missed, like, the most interesting part of the entire history of the Middle East. I told her I took notes. Anna can tell you. Next time, Jamila, I mean Jamla, okay, I'll make sure it's recording. Next time you go to the bathroom, um, do it before class, okay? <laughs> I didn't know I had to go before class. <laughs> 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 oh, goodness gracious. Weird child. Okay. Oops, sorry. Okay. Ah. Yeah, so, you know, that's all there. So there's that word diaspora. So all the Jews are deported. I've already said all that. 1949, that's when the Jews got Israel back. Who gave it to them? The West. Do you know why the West? The United Nations, which is the West. Name me one non-Western country in the United Nations. Okay, China. But you know what? Name, name, name me the other four. They're all Western, and it's a... Uh... Yeah. UK. Yeah, 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 yeah. All those big Western countries. United States, UK, France, Russia, and... No, China. That's it. Five. Five, five uh, Security Council members. So... Look what, look what Europe did after World War II. They said, let's give the Jews Israel. Well, why, why was it such an important thing to think about this? Why was it such an important thing to find a homeland for the Jews after World War II? They were all like by? Uh, Hitler. By Hitler. And Hitler was from what civilization? The West. The West. And the West is what religion? Christian. Christian. And so, okay, we just like... Our anti-Jewish, anti-Semitism got so out of control that we just murdered almost six million of them. So let's solve the problem by making a homeland for them in what civilization? The Muslim area. Let's just, let's just take some land from the Muslims and give that to the Jews. How are the Muslims going to feel about that? There happen to be Muslims living in Palestine where the Europeans said, okay, Jews, you can, yeah. And so that is why since, since World War II, the United Nations caused this Arab-Israeli conflict that has been raging ever since because there were Muslims living here. And we just, we, just, we the UN, settled it with Jews. Um, but, again, I mean, this is interesting. I hate this kind of feeling, the teenage face feeling. But it is interesting. I hope you see that. Because how do the Jews see this? They have been saying next year in Jerusalem, every Hanukkah, for almost 2,000 years. And in 1949, there's our exile and return story all over again. All right. Yep. Before the Jews were returned like 60 years ago, they were still living in Israel, right? There, were, there was a, a small number, and they had started going back. But no, mo Muslim, Muslims had been living there. So they were just, like, scattered all over the place? Yeah. So when they were given it back, they just all moved back? The European ones did, because they were the ones who just saw Christian Europe 
commit genocide against them. It's not safe to be Jewish among these Christians. So we, we tried to blend in and you know, be, be European, but they came out of the closet with their anti-Semitism and showed us that we can't be safe here. So we're going to go back. Um, so, okay, now let's talk about early Christianity. Notice, when did Jesus die? 30. So here's your next subtopic for Christianity. We're back on our topic now. Early Christianity. Here we go. Notice what we have not talked about yet. Where, when did the Jewish Bible get made? We haven't talked about that. Clearly, Jesus was not walking around with the Christian Bible because the Christian Bible is about Jesus. There was no, like, Christian Bible yet. He's dead. But the religion is growing. The Roman religion was the Greek religion. It was polytheistic. I want you to sit up. I want you to be active because you have to write an outline if this thing shows up and it's got to, right? So I, I'm doing that because I, I want you to succeed. Um, the Romans despised the Christian religion because the Christians would not worship Roman gods. They were Roman citizens, I'm sorry, they were Roman subjects, but they would not worship Roman gods because they're monotheistic, they can't. Same problem the Jews had. Also, because it was a religion that was for the poor, Jesus, Jesus glorified the poor, and he taught against the wealthy class. So his message was for the poor. And so the Romans, the elites, the upper class Romans, thought of it as a religion of slaves, widows, and illiterates. Old women who can't read, slaves. The four books of the Bible, the Gospels. Gospels means good news. There are four different stories of Jesus' life, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And they were all written decades after Jesus died. Historically, this is really interesting. The earliest book is the book, not a, it's not in the right order, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The earliest book is actually Mark. And Mark was written, Mark was written in the 60s, I believe, so 30 years, over 30 years after Jesus died, telling the story of this guy who died 30 years ago. That's Mark. Matthew and Luke, they have the same details as Mark, but they add some, and they're later. And here's the weird thing. There's more miracles in the later ones. Jamila, do you hear that? Yeah. What would you expect? Why would Mark leave out some miracles? Miracles you would want to like include every single one, wouldn't you? It's a miracle. Would you like go, oh, that, that miracle's not important. I'm not going to talk about it. That violation of the laws of nature is uh, unimpressive, so we won't talk about that one. More miracles are in the later books, not the first one. If Jesus performed all these miracles, we ask, why are so many of them not in Mark, but they only show up in later I Gospels? Remember. Yeah, what? One of them could be Mark was intended so that Matthew and Luke could write a book, but the second one was <laughs> I feel like that's totally about that. And then the second one is that Mark didn't know that much about That's okay, and that's a good one. Maybe Mark didn't know. But how well, could Mark... Much. That's true. There was no internet. There was no... Oh, when it goes through mouth and mouth, like... When it the telephone game. Yeah. Okay. Um, and this is the most interesting thing to me. When people ask me if I'm a Christian, I say, well, are you? And they say yes. And I say, well, then to you, probably not. But to me, yeah. Uh, because you're a Christian. So you would say I'm not, but I know more about Christianity than you. And so I can say that I am, but not like you. What is he talking about? <clears throat> what? There were other... Christianities, all sorts of them, all over the place. They had different beliefs. The most interesting one to me and to those of us who have discovered it is this one, the Gospel of Thomas. 
I just told you, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are the only books in the Christian Bible. They're the four Gospels. But here's a fifth one, Thomas. And there's a sixth one, Mary, a woman writing a Gospel. And Jason, when a woman writes a Gospel, you can bet that it teaches that women are more important than a Gospel written by men. There's the Gospel of Mary. These are not in the Bible. The Gospel of Judas, the guy who betrayed Jesus, not in the Bible. Only Matthew, Mark, and Luke are. Um, Notice, good, we've talked about Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John is the fourth one. I'm just going to tell you about the Gospel of Thomas because the Thomas Church taught this. Jesus was not God. Jesus was a philosopher. And Jesus' mission was to bring people wisdom in hard times, like the Taoists, in a sense, like the Buddhists, in a sense. And if you listen to Jesus when he says the kingdom of heaven is within you, it has nothing to do with believing in him and going to heaven. He's saying it's inside of you right now. And you can actually have a spiritual like awakening where you are, you discover the, the heaven within you even if you're poor, right? You have a spiritual transformation. So that's what the Thomas Church was. They were focusing on what Jesus said, taught, not how he died. The man spent most of his life walking around talking to people, not dying on a cross every day. That was their argument. Why are you focusing on the cross? Because we are, we are focusing on what he taught. Uh, so for the first 300 years of Christianity, here's the final point. For the first 300 years of Christianity, after he died, there was not one set belief. There were all sorts of them. Some said he was God. Some said he wasn't. Okay? That's the main idea there. Please make sure that you get that. I'm going to pause so you get that. From 300 BC, I'm sorry, CE, until 330, for the first 300 years after Jesus died, people were arguing about what he even was. There was no one Christianity. There were Christianities. Is he God? Is he not God? Is, is, is the Messiah somebody who you believe in him and you go to heaven? Is, does his crucifixion matter or does it not matter? Was he a philosopher or was he God? And so that's what people were arguing about. Or, or that's, you know, that's the different ways it was being taught. Yeah. Well, what are the years again? 330, uh, 30, when he died. And then for the next 300 years, there were Christianities. Different from 30 to 330. So how did Christianity spread? This guy is our next important one. How it spread. Paul was a Jew, but he was a Roman citizen. And Paul at first worked for the Roman government because he was a Roman citizen. And his job was to find Christians and report them as terrorists and have them arrested and killed. So he was a secret agent looking for Christians to turn into the cops so that they could be arrested as terrorists against the Roman Empire. But on, on driving, a, driving, riding a horse through Syria on the, on the road to Damascus, if you want to be an educated Christian, the road to Damascus experience. Damascus is the capital of Syria today. Paul, has, Paul is struck by a weird revelation he falls off his horse, he's blind, and he hears a voice saying, Paul, why do you persecute me? And it's the voice of Jesus. And so Paul, Jesus, dead Jesus, reveals himself to Paul, and Paul converts to Christianity. The guy who was like the villain, cop hunting the Christians, joins the Christians after this miraculous revelation. He's a Roman citizen. He can go anywhere in the Roman Empire during the Pax Romana, with his passport and um, not get hassled, and he didn't. So he was organizing churches all over the place. The Christian, the Christian Bible, the New Testament, it's those four Gospels that we said, and then it's a bunch of letters from Paul to, church, to different churches in the early Roman Empire. A bunch of letters from Paul to the different churches that he was the manager of. Yes? Why was he organizing churches if they destroyed 
Because he believed that Jesus died and Jesus was God and that you need to spread the good news. Believe in Jesus, you will go to heaven and live forever. That's why. To spread the good news of the fact that the Messiah has come. It's not political, it's spiritual. If you believe in him, you'll go to heaven and live forever in paradise. Yeah. He was, uh, what was he before? He was working with the Roman government. Yeah, he was a, he was a, um, he, the equivalent of a cop or a secret servant agent, service agent. Guys looking for terrorists in the United States today for the FBI, Paul was doing that for the Roman Empire. Looking for Christians, though, because they were preaching um, a different kingdom than the Roman Empire. Who was attracted? The poor, the illiterate, the slaves, the lower classes of Roman society. This was a message of hope. The government was doing nothing for them, so the message grew and grew. As the churches grew, they developed a bureaucracy themselves. From a Rome became the capital of the church, the Vatican. So this is the this is the Roman bureaucracy, the the Catholic bureaucracy, the church bureaucracy. The headquarters, that's the Vatican, right? The capital of the Christian religion. And then you've got the next level is dioceses. These are all dioceses. A diocese is like a state, a province, a big area of the Roman Empire. How do you manage anything? This is management. If you go to business school and you've got like, you, you know, you own McDonald's, well, you've got to like manage McDonald's. How are you going to manage all those McDonald's all over the world? You're going to make regions. Yeah, really good. So here a region is a diocese. And then you break up a diocese into, anybody know? Parishes. Yeah, because yeah, I know this is, this is fascinating stuff. You're on the edge of your seat. It's okay. like, it's so well, suspenseful. You know, I have to move out there with I Parishes are, on, picture like states and then you've got counties inside of states. It's like the, it's like the county level. And so you see that there's a hierarchy. And so it starts becoming like a government thing. It's got this organization where we're taking care of the poor people, not through the government, but through the churches, right? They're all coming to the churches, and we've got this massive organization from the central. It's like Chincha Huang Di, right? It's like a centralized government. Yeah. Dioceses. This would be like provinces. Yeah, so notice one diocese has like, you know, three more parishes in it. Yeah, so we're just subdividing territory. It's just basic management. And it was mirrored on the Roman Empire's structure. Right? The capital of Rome is in Rome. And then they, they set up different uh, dioceses in Rome. So it was, the church was imitating the Roman government and the Roman bureaucracy. Now, why is this interesting? Because when the Roman Empire fell, guess what didn't fall? The church bureaucracy. They still kept this organization. There's no more Western Roman Empire, but there's still the Roman Catholic Church with this organization. And it exists today. If you talk about continuity and change over time, what the church created through Paul and these people as they spread still exists today and controls through dioceses and parishes, Catholics all over the world now. But it all goes back to the Pope in Rome. What would you say? So, okay, our last part. You know that the Roman Empire, we broke it down, we analyzed it. The first 200 years, good. After that, a slow motion train wreck the last 300 years. As governments become worse and worse in helping the people, 
other institutions that offer help become more and more attractive. If the government's not going to help me, who will? I've heard this Christian church is really good. In Islam, it's the same thing. I've, the government's not helping us. We're poor. We're miserable. The mosque, they do help. They care. They feed. They shelter. They clothe. They support. And so membership grows. What am I trying to make clear to you here? This is insightful. And when you, when you look at different parts of the world, you ask, when the government's good, how high is the religion versus when the government's bad? And it's almost inverse. The more government goes down, the more religion goes up. Because when you have no hope, you start thinking about God more. You start thinking about religion more. When you're like really, really comfortable and you know, everything's like good, good economy, good job, good law enforcement, you're too happy going shopping to think about you know, the need to like, go to church or whatever, pray it. Yeah. I can't, I can't, I want to finish this. So here's our last one, 3.30, 3.30, Constantine. We just finished the spread, our new subtopic, rise and spread of Christianity, Jesus' life, and then he dies and it spreads because the, the politics is getting bad. And now, the whole time though, the Christians have been hated by the Romans until the Emperor Constantine in 330. You already know his story. He was fighting against the other three tetrarchs. He won. And because the Roman religion and the Roman government were so unpopular at this point because it was such a slow motion train wreck, they stopped, the people stopped caring about the Roman religion. They stopped being patriotic. They didn't care about the emperors. And they did. Christianity mushroomed at this time. It became a major religion only like in the hundreds of years after Jesus died. And at that point, Constantine was a guy who was like, that's a lot of soldiers. That's a, that's a, that's a big base for my power. Yes, Nicole? Um, how did Apostle Paul um, changing his religion affect the Roman Empire? Right? Oh, because um, affect the Roman Empire? Well, like the, the By spreading Christianity, which said... Yeah, he set up churches all over the Roman Empire. Thank you. Yeah. And, and he, yeah, and so at this point, there's a lot of Christians all over the Roman Empire, and Constantine's fighting for control of the Roman Empire. And Christianity is more popular to a lot of the lower classes, especially, than the Roman government and the Roman religion. So I'm waging war against three other tetrarchs. I need soldiers. I need support. I, I need popularity. There are a lot of Christians out there now. And so he did recognize Christianity. Christian, Christians had been crucified, fed to the lions, burned as lampposts, persecuted in all sorts of ways for hundreds of years. They were hated by the Roman government. Constantine turns it around and recognizes Christianity. And that's what, the, that's what it sounded like when they were being fed to the lions. Now, and so here's the interesting part. Constantine is an elite. Patriotic Romans believe in the Roman gods, the traditional Roman gods. If you're a Republican, you believe in the traditional American religion. Back then, if you were a patriot Roman elite, you believed in the Roman gods. So when they saw Constantine, a patrician, an elite, convert to Christianity, take Christianity seriously, they were like, how could you do that? They were, and he was embarrassed. Why was he embarrassed? Because the elites were saying to him, they don't even know what they believe themselves. The Thomas Church says he's not God. The John Church says he is God. The Christians themselves don't know what they believe. Stop. So, Constantine calls together, and this is the most important thing right now. He calls together the Council of Nicaea. Nicaea is just a, state in Italy, a city in Italy. And Constantine gets all of the authorities from the Christian church together, and he goes, you're going to sit inside this room, in this council. I'm surrounding the room with legionnaires, Roman cops, with weapons. You are not going to leave this room until you can say what Christians believe. You're going to define what Christians believe so you no longer embarrass me, the emperor, with your contradictions. Two weeks later, they come out with a list. And this is what happened. 
the Gospel of Judas. The, the, look at me. The guys, the, the church that believed in the Gospel of Judas, that leader of that church was sitting there. The woman who led the church of Mary, she was sitting there. The Thomas church, they were sitting there. And the John church, the one that said Jesus is God. Believe in him, you'll go to heaven. Don't believe in him, you'll go to hell. They were sitting there. And they argued for two weeks. And at the end, the John side won. And guess what happened to these books? They were declared satanic, <coughs> in error, evil, wrong, deceptions of the devil. And they came out. So all these guys lost. And the Jesus is God size won. I'm just going to skip that. And they made the Nicene Creed which is repeated to this day. We believe in God the Father. He made heaven and earth and all things visible and invisible. This is said in Catholic services to this day. It was written in this council. And what does it do? You don't have to write this down. Just get the main ideas. We believe that Jesus was born of a virgin, that he is God's son. <coughs> was crucified for us, was suffered and buried, rose again, went to heaven, sits on God's right hand in heaven, and will come again at the end of time to judge every person and send those who don't believe to hell and those who do to heaven, whose kingdom shall have no end. The John side won. What happened to these books? The Roman government sent cops out to burn every copy of these books, and they did. Do you know when we discovered these books? No, 50 years ago. A guy in Egypt, a guy in Egypt, a kid in Egypt had goats, and he was herding his goats, and he lost one 50 years ago in the deserts of Egypt, and he loses a goat, a little shepherd, and he, he thinks, well, maybe it's in that, that little hole in the, the cavey thing there, and so he's like, bah, little goat, you down there, and he doesn't, but he's like... Well, maybe it's just like her. I just want to see if I can hear. And so he throws a rock into this, into this cavey thing. He throws a rock, and he hears not a rock just going echo, echo. No, he hears a shattering clay pot. And he's like, that just sounded like a shattering clay pot. And so he climbs down in there, and he opens the shattered clay pot, and it has scrolls. Scrolls from 330, after the Nicene Creed, when these... Gospels that for 300 years, that's older than America, for 300 years, these churches believed that they had answers to, you know, to life's problems. They thought they were real Christianities. It's the most successful book burning in the history of the planet because we did not know about these Gospels until they were discovered in Egypt after World War II. We translated them. We're the first people who can read about them. Christians did not know, and most Christians still don't. That's the funny part. The Gnostic Bible. This whole thing, it's the Bible that was burned and banished from the earth for 1,700 years. And we can read it now. What cracks me up as a, as a human being is seeing how little people care about the fact that we can read it now. It's like, oh, I don't want to know anything about what I believe. I don't want to know anything about what has been burned and silenced and you know, buried from from history for 1,700 years. Yeah? Technically, wouldn't this, if people start knowing about this, wouldn't this start being conflict again about what is Christianity? Yeah, but there's still, there's been conflict about what is Christianity. That's what the Protestants did. Um, but just, uh, yeah, yes, oh, it would certainly upset the people who won and burned all the books. It would upset them. Um, notice the last thing of the Nicene Creed. We believe in the one holy and Catholic church, right? So all those other churches? No, no. How did Zeus die, just in a nutshell? Constantine only, so that's 330, the rise and spread of Christianity. Here's the last part of the story. There is now not Christianities, but one Christianity. That's what the Nicene Creed does, right? It defines Christianity. Believe in Jesus who will go to heaven. He was God. In the story. No more Christianities, one now. 
Constantine did not outlaw all the others. How did people become, how did, how did Europe become Christian? This guy, Theodosius, an emperor after Constantine, who said, Christianity is the only legal religion in the Roman Empire. You must be Christian. You cannot be. It's against the law. Zeus, Hera, Apollo, Mars, pagan. You can't. And he sent the Roman army out to destroy all of the temples to Zeus and to Hera and to all the others. And what did he put on top of them so that they could never come back again? Churches. And so under all of those ancient churches from the Roman Empire are the ruins of temples to the pagan religions, the Greco-Roman gods. Greco-Roman? Yeah, that's just our fancy way of saying Greek and Roman. What about the people who were like, no, I believe in Hera and Zeus, and I love my traditional Roman gods? No, they weren't killed. But if they wanted a good job in the Roman government, they got preferences if they were Christian. You've got a better chance of getting a job if you're a Christian, that sort of thing. Um, so there were, there were ways to tempt people. So that is how not only Christianity rose and conquered Europe, it's also how it affected traditional Greco-Roman religion. To me, that, that's a very interesting thing. You've all heard of your Greek mythology, Zeus, the Iliad, all that stuff. You've heard of all those gods, but you've, if you've never asked the question, well, how do gods just die? In one word, what's the answer? How do, in one word, what's the answer? How do gods die, Sam? Politics. Politics. How do they die? Somebody passes a law saying you can't worship it anymore. Our last point. This is the end of the Roman Empire. Please, I know, I don't like, I don't like doing these long lectures. I'm doing this because I kind of have to because of what they've done to me next door. But, but please, here, this is interesting. I, I could talk about this forever with somebody who's into this stuff, but I just know how it feels to be sitting there listening to a guy talk forever. But, but, so please hear this. I'm, I'm asking you. This is the end of the Roman Empire. Remember? It ends around 475. So, St. Augustine is our last really important guy. Why? Because he adds two things to Christian belief. One, and the most important one, is this. Salvation, meaning you go to heaven, not hell. The only way you can have it is if you're a member of the church, the Catholic church. Salvation in the church only. Just write that down. Make sure you have it. Right. Which Catholic church? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's only the Catholic Church now, again. Now, be clear on that. The Catholic Church means there's one Christianity now. No, no more Christianities. One. This means that if a priest kicks you out of church, what happens to your eternal soul? You go to hell. You go to hell. So look at the power the Catholic Church has now. A priest can kick you out of the church, and that's not just inconvenient. That's its sentence to eternal hellfire. And so, through this, the spread of this belief, now to not belong to the church, meant by definition automatically, when you die, you go to hell. Look at the power the church institution has with that last move. They're way more dangerous than your parents threatening to ground you. All right.